politics. We are here to discuss things that no longer exist. Uh, I would also like to find out who here is obsessed, oh, excuse me, who here was obsessed with dinosaurs when they were five? Yeah. Yay, good crowd. <laughs> and who still is? <laughs> Triceratops is the best. Uh, do we have any paleontologists here tonight? Someone's dad, yay! <laughs> dinosaurs are so cool. In general, I feel we feel a significant amount of nostalgia for the magnificent and terrifying animals that once were, because I certainly do. Uh, speaking of which, did anyone have a chance to see the art upstairs in the lounge? A few. Uh, it's not still there. You missed it. Ha ha, it went extinct. Uh, <laughs> those of you that did see it, uh, that, that was my collection from last year. Uh, I, I painted a collection of animals that went extinct as a result of human activity because I love the idea of capturing an image of something that I have not, nor will I ever see. I think it's a very interesting dynamic. Um, also, by painting and discussing extinct animals, I can preserve those animals and, and their extinction stories into our current living memory by, by retelling these stories. So coming in tonight, I knew that there was a story I wanted to share to, to sort of frame the evening. Uh, there is a particular flightless island-dwelling bird that became extinct very quickly after first human contact. No! <laughs> Shenanigans! Uh, I want to talk about the Stevens Island Wren. This is a good story. Hold on. Now, Furman's, humans first interacted with this wren in uh, 1894 on Stevens Island, which is a small island off the coast of New Zealand. Now, a few years prior, a small farm and a lighthouse was built on the, the island to help with shipping routes. And human, thank you. Uh, <laughs> humans inhabited the island in January of 1894. There were 17 people in all, three lighthouse keepers and a couple small families that ran the farm to, to keep the island sustained. Now, one of the lighthouse keepers named D David Lyle was a naturalist by, by hobby and in February notes an unusual bird existing on the island. He observes a small olive and brown flightless bird with, uh, with a yellow stripe across its eyes that he calls a rock wren. He writes that it is running around the rocks like a mouse and so quick in its movements that I could not get near enough to hit it with a stick or stone. <laughs> Like you, this begets two questions from me. Number one, why on earth would your first ornithological metric be whether you can or cannot hit a bird with a stick? Number two, what could this mysterious bird be? As noted, this particular bird was too fast for the sociopath of a naturalist to catch it. So he did not see the bird up close until June of the same year. Aww. Aww. He's a murderer. <laughs> when his cat and lighthouse companion Tibbles left a bird carcass on the doorstep of the lighthouse, Lyle realized that it was an unusual specimen. It was not like anything he'd seen before. So he preserved the specimen in a jar of oil and sent it with a friend via steamboat to the mainland where it was shown to this guy, Sir Walter Buller. Sir Walter uh, was a leading expert in New Zealand birds. He, in fact, published a notable book, The History of New Zealand Birds, which is one of the uh, eminent textbooks. Uh, and you can also tell by all of his flair that he is very important. <laughs> he also realized that this was a unique bird and immediately shipped the specimen to London to have it drawn and archived via lithograph by his friend and leading bird illustrator, John Gerard Kuhlemans. Keep in mind, at this point, this poor bird sp specimen has been toyed with and killed by Tibbles the cat, inspected by Lyles, packed in oil, ridden a steamboat, probed by Buller, then shipped to en England. So the, the specimen that Kuhlemans got ended up looking a little rough. <laughs> oh my god. This is nightmare fuel. This is not a cute little bird. <laughs> now, don't worry. Kuhlemans is a professional, and using uh, descriptions of the bird's plumage and looking at anatomical features, he was able to capture an enduring likeness of the bird. <laughs> this is, in fact, what the, this rock wren looks like. And uh, on, on the table there, I have my own, 
uh, my own study in anatomy, and that's my version of, the, of this rock run. <coughs> Meanwhile, Tibbles continues this murder spree. He continues to leave little dead birds on the lighthouse doorstep. Lyle collects them all and strikes up a business deal to sell the specimens to a man named Henry Travers, who's a taxidermist and a dealer of curios. He gets nine more samples from Tibbles and uh, gives them to Travers. Now Travers realizes that there is money to be had. So he arranges to sell all nine samples to another Walter named Lord Walter Rothschild. He wrote Rothschild and uh, enticed him, basically saying, in a short time, there will be no wrens left. How very true that is. Uh, and Walter Buller may have had money to purchase specimens, but he didn't have wealth and prestige and the ability to ride a giant tortoise like Lord Walter Rothschild. This is apparently when you're like a bazillionaire and a naturalist in the late 1890s, you can go around riding Galapagos tortoises. It's a thing. That, that is actually him. The plot thickens, a duel begins. Now, in a very short time after, Rothschild attended a meeting of the British Ornithologi Ornithologist Club and stood up during the meeting and hastily admitted a description and taxonomy of the, the bird into the club's meeting notes, thus declaring the wren to be the Traversia Leali after those who collected the specimens, Henry Travers and David Leali. Now, really, maybe it should be the Lyalia Tibulzi, but semantics. However, the other Walter had been working on an academic paper already, and he had been describing and naming and giving the taxonomy of the wren. So Rothschild claimed jumped the naming of the bird nine days before Buller's paper was published by the British Ornithologists Club. Walter Buller was pissy about this for the rest of his life. And even well after the tortoise riding Rothschild passed away, just wrote really bitchy things about him in all of his, all of his papers. It turns out that this was indeed a significant find. The Stevens Island Wren, or Lyle's Wren, turns out to be only one of five flightless songbirds ever known to science. And, thank you. And, the only one of them that had ever been observed alive, the other four having been discovered in the fossil record. However, Lyle's wren would not be around for long. Now, two months later, in February of 1895, Lyle wrote to Buller, the cats have become wild and are making sad havoc among all the birds. And Lyle procured the last specimen ever early in March. And a newspaper, a local newspaper, soon after wrote, there is a very good reason to believe that this bird is no longer to be found on the island. And as it is not known to exist anywhere else, it has apparently become quite extinct. <laughs> like on the scale of extinction, it's quite extinct. <laughs> this is probably a record performance in the way of extermination. <laughs> God damn it, Tibbles. <laughs> so Rothschild, who, who is the bird name stealing jerk, uh, he went on to write that it was in fact Tibbles who was solely responsible for the bird's decline. <laughs> and for a hundred years, Tibbles was vilified as the only known individual ever to wipe out an entire species. <laughs> God damn it, Tibbles. Now, before you go and uh, get your pitchfork out for this cat who probably died over a century ago, Let's look at this timeline that recent historians have compiled. Now, we know that human interaction really, really geared up in early 1894. And in February, it was noted that the inhabitants of the farm lost a pregnant cat. It escaped and began living on the island. So it's not just Tibbles. Over a year, feral cats had overrun the island. So it's cats in general, not just this cat in particular that caused the the decline. Paradoxically, I would like to note that even though Tibbles did help hunt Lyle's wren to extinction, most of the about 16 samples of the bird in the world today, most of these samples were caught by Tibbles. 